Ben, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Tom. How about yourself? Doing right. Thank you very much. Can't complain. Thanks very much for taking the time to join me today. This is uh, one of the sessions I've been really looking forward to because there are a number of problems that ServiceBot in particular solve, uh, which are kind of common throughout the community, which are billing. So yeah. would you care to kind of give us like a, just a quick intro to yourself and what you do at ServiceBot, and then we can um, dive into ServiceBot itself and then dive into what we're actually going to be doing and covering today. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. So my name is Ben Sears. I'm the CTO and founder of ServiceBot. Um, and basically what ServiceBot does is we provide embeddable billing pages that you can just plug right into your application and gain that kind of uh, billing capability without having to do any sort of development effort or integration work with a system like Stripe. We run on top, everything runs on top of Stripe for us. So like if you're trying to get your Stripe integration set up, service bus definitely something that you should probably look into. And just quickly, why, why is that difficult? Right. So really there's a, there's a lot to billing. Um, a lot of people are able to get started pretty quickly with like selling subscriptions and that kind of thing. Just by using like, there's all kinds of forms out there, but when you start actually trying to scale your billing, you run into a lot of issues. For example, uh, let's say you have a customer, they, they're looking to, you know, get a refund or you have a customer coming to you looking to download invoices, having a customer looking to you know, upgrade or downgrade, cancel, maybe get a coupon, free trial. All these different little capabilities are things that you're going to have to end up building if you're going to build it yourself. And, and that means either like usually it's going to mean making API calls, which is as close to coding as you get in the no code space. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. And if anyone's going to try to do like billing via API, it can get like messy real quick. And then when you're dealing with like financial stuff, I guess it's probably better to use a, a product for it. All right. Um, how did, uh, before we kind of dive into the meat of this uh, conversation workshop, how did ServiceBot like come about? What was the, like, the aha moment for you guys? Oh, uh, well, we've had quite the journey at ServiceBot. Uh, we actually started, we're get coming up on four years now um, of we've been around. And we started off actually with this vision of like a startup in a box where you basically are able to kind of use ServiceBot, just kind of have everything you need to just kind of get started running a, 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 a software as a service company or just a, any sort of service company it was we we were i was a big fan of the x aas anything as a service um, kind of mindset so we were trying to build a product that could you know uh, make that happen but then we kind of evolved and we we have it's funny if you look at some of our original uh, documentation and our original like iterations we uh, we're catering towards things like freelancers and like you know selling dog walking services and just things that you would sell on a recurring basis that weren't necessarily like tech stuff and we've kind of evolved and at some point, like maybe two years ago, we switched to targeting only, only SaaS companies. We were like SaaS, 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 SaaS. And, and now over this past year, um, we, we've really shifted. Now we're targeting, you know, no code as well as SaaS because SaaS is really was, was our bread and butter. Like, you know, we, but we got a lot of people coming to us using like no code tools and trying to use us. And they were struggling because we just didn't have, you know, there's there's a server side component to service bot which people kind of ran into issues with but so now we were kind of listening and realizing that hey this would be a great thing for the no code community and the no code tools if we can just integrate with as many of these as possible we'd be in a really good place so that's kind of where we are now is that we just came out like this year we came out with a, a huge bubble plugin and we're, I'm looking at um, integrating with things like Adalo, Builder, Glide, uh, just like looking at all the options and, you know, slowly but surely we'll hopefully be on all of them. <laughs> nice. Love it. So what is it we're going to be doing today? So what, what I'm planning to do today is uh, I'm going to be showing you exactly what ServiceBot does. I'm going to be showing how to get it working in a bubble application. And I'm going to be kind of going, I built, we built out a bubble template that, uh, has service by kind of already hooked up and I kind of go through what that actually does and how to use it. And then 
kind of go back and take a step back and show you actually how we built this template, just so you understand, mm. so the audience understands, you know, what went into it and kind of uh, from a concept, like it's one thing having everything built for you, but it's another kind of learning how it was built. So that's kind of what I want to go through as well. And then so uh, after the, oh, sorry. No, no, go on. Um, yeah, and then after that, I think I'm just gonna go. We're gonna go through some of the more advanced things like Stripe web hooks and uh, you know how to actually manage your subscriptions. So that that's kind of what I nice. have planned for today. Awesome. So if anybody's actually watching this live on um, Periscope, Twitter, YouTube, uh, or Facebook, you can actually leave a comment and we can bring that up on screen. So if you've got any questions about how Service Bot works or anything other like no code related then pop it um, in the comments and we can get that answered for you. So without further ado, Ben, I can hand over to you and we can kick things off and then I will prod and poke around with any questions that I feel people might need answering or I would like answering purely selfishly. Sounds good. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, nice. Can you see? Oh, wait, there we go. Can you see my screen now? Uh, there we go. All right, so to start off with, uh, I'm just gonna kind of go through my service bot account and kind of go through the kind of capabilities and then we'll go and dive into actually using some of this stuff. So at a glance, right, what, what we provide are these billing pages. So we have five of them right now. We have a plan picker, which uh, generally you use as part of your onboarding where you know, you're, you're already signed up for the app and it's, it's, used, it's used very well in the freemium model where, you know, you sign up is free, but then you can use the app a bit. But when you actually want to make the user pay, you send them to this plan picker where they can pick the tiers and all that stuff. So um, that's kind of where, where we're at, where this is for. Like, so you can, you know, pick, there can be multiple tiers. Um, you can disable tiers. There's all kinds of configuration options for this one. Um, that's and that, that's really good for, as I said, you know, upgrading the user. Customer portal is really our bread and butter. This is uh, this is where a user has already been a subscriber, so they already have a subscription with you, and the portal lets them kind of manage that subscription. So you know, it lets them cancel, change plan. Uh, change their credit card, download invoices, right? So you can like enable change plan, allow, they can have resubscribe. There's all kinds of configurable options on the left sidebar here. And before I kind of go further, there's there's a, the, the way that this works actually is uh, there's a, once you actually have the billing page created, there's an embed code. And with, if you have like an HTML site, you can just plug it in with uh, this, but what we're gonna be going through is the bubble way of doing it, which you basically just copy okay. this JSON and plug it into a bubble element. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit, but I just want to kind of prep Can everybody. Just, um, just take one quick step back for anybody who hasn't um, seen ServiceBot before. Would you be able to just open up the dashboard and just kind of tell um, tell everyone like kind of what what we're looking at here? So you're logging into ServiceBot and kind of what have we got? Uh, right. So what we have right in front of us on this dashboard are all the different billing pages I've created over uh, over the past month or so because this is actually a pretty new functionality having billing pages before um, before uh, the the big launch last month what we had basically was uh, it, there wasn't you don't save the configurations you, you just get like a big a big code snippet and then paste that into your site but so what you okay. see right here is basically. Um, all the different billing pages that could be embedded on different sites. This one is actually on live mode, you can see. So this means it's using your live Stripe account. It can take live payments. Um, and then you, you can see which ones I've actually embedded or not embedded on the site or which ones actually have secure setup or not. Um, secure setup basically means that you're using a, a hash that gets generated on some sort of back end. Um, and it validates that the person using that embed actually should be using that embed. Um, so, and if you click in any of these, you can actually see what, what's been configured here. So like for this one, it's, it's, it looks like a, it's like a free, a free plan here. Um, gotcha. And then obviously if we just copied and pasted this code here, like I can just open up a code pen and I can show you, It'll, it should just pop right up if I create one. So pop that in there and then, uh, 
yeah, right there, you can see this is how kind of nice. you would use it. So you can pick the plan, go ahead and do the checkout, that kind of thing. Brilliant. Yes. Thanks for thanks for doing that. Yeah. Um, so am I good to just kind of keep going through these things? Absolutely. All righty. So pricing page is uh, an embeddable where you, this is this is designed for you to just stick it on your website. Um, I think I like to show one of our customers uh, pricing the way they are using it. So basically on their on their this is cleverly they do a lead gen service. And uh, what, what they this is how they're using the pricing page. Basically, it has you know their plans. It has their interval. You can say they have monthly, every three month, every six month. You can see how much discount they get. Uh, you can you can have a uh, you know the features list, and then you can obviously pick your plan and do a checkout. And these things can be styled however you want. Um, it's a little more complicated in Bubble because Bubble doesn't have like a native way of, of doing CSS, but it's still very possible. Um, I might. I'm not the best at styling, so I don't know if I'll go through it. If we have time, I can go through it later, but and if people are interested. But basically, uh, this is kind of out of the box how our customers generally use it is make a, a page on their on their public facing site for people to get onboarded with is uh, generally what this pricing embed is for. Gotcha. Yeah. And any questions, Tom? Uh, nope, not so far. Uh, I was just going right. to uh, say about say about styling. I'm not good at styling either, so I'm with you on that one. <laughs> All right. So uh, next is checkout form. It's it's this is the, probably the most basic one. This one is just a like you know when you click the select plan, this form that pops up here. Um, this is the checkout form. We actually just enter your credit card information. You don't get to pick a plan or anything. You have it's, it's basically this is what the customer needs to pay for. Display them the form, and then they can, we can you can take payments that way. Um, I don't think I need to explain that too much. It's a very common concept to have the these checkout forms. Um, and then uh, then the last but not least, we have the invoice portal. And invoice portal kind of came about because it's basically the customer portal that you see here. Only it's only this invoice section. So it kind of came about because some customers were saying, "Hey, I only want to show the the invoices that my customer has, and nothing else. I don't want them to manage their subscription. I don't want anything else. I just want them to be able to download invoices." So that's kind of the point of this invoice portal is uh, just to give that kind of functionality. Yeah, and that's actually something which is quite tricky, and that we've um, had issues with doing like invoices like oh, it's actually something it's quite tricky with stripe is that right so stripe stripe does it pretty well actually so this is we actually use stripes invoices to do this so um if you actually look in, in a stripe account we can pull open like invoices here and these are basically all the payments that go on in a stripe account you can click on one of these and what we do for this download invoice functionality is that um, Stripe actually gives you a link somewhere to the PDF. Let's see if I can find ah, invoice PDF. So this link is what we kind of show the, the end customer and lets them just download this specific thing. And every the way invoices work in Stripe is every billing cycle for a subscription, it generates a new invoice. So uh, basically, every time a, a customer is charged on a monthly basis or recurring basis, one of these invoices gets generated, and they'll be able to see each one of each one of these invoices as a line item, um, showing like the status of when it's paid, when it was due, and then obviously download it. Mm, nice. Yeah, the one of the things we're most proud of with our uh, is is how closely integrated we are with Stripe because we we basically don't build any any of these functionalities ourselves. We try and use as much of Stripe's uh, feature set as possible, um, just so we're not reinventing the wheel. And um, we communicate closely with the Stripe team to make sure we're not building anything that they're already working on. So um, that, that's it's good from for both of us. Gotcha. So uh, if you have any, uh, if you don't have any other questions about that, that's kind of our feature set and what we do. Um, and if you, unless you have any other questions, I was, I'll get started on actually uh, integrating this with a bubble application. Yeah, let's go ahead and um, try integrating it. I'm sure I'm going to have um, more questions like as we go along, just because uh, although ServiceBot seems like it's simple, like on on the surface, there's a lot of actual 
tricky functionality that goes into actually building it. So yeah, yeah, for sure. There's definitely like a lot of little edge cases, and it's, it, there's a lot of complexity hidden behind. We've tr we've worked very hard to make it seem simple. <laughs> yeah, it does. You've done a good job. Yeah. Okay, so to start with, um, I think what I'll, I'll do is I'll actually explain how to get started in Stripe because the first thing you want to do is actually set up your um, your billing model within your Stripe account. So the way that it works with ServiceBot is basically we we take it as Stripe has this concept of a product and a product has a, a price inside of it. So for example, if I look at one of these uh, ones I've already created, you can see that this is the product called basic tier. And in it, we have the price, which is a monthly subscription. Uh, would, would, if they, so it's $5 per month is this price for this product. And you can add multiple prices into a product. Now, because Stripe is so flexible in this way, we kind of guide the user towards our model of modeling prices, so just so it's compatible with ServiceBot. And what that means is that for each tier you have, like basic tier, premium tier, enterprise tier, for example, each you would have one product for each tier. And, and you can have any number of prices as long as each price has a different interval. For example, I can add an annual price to this basic tier. So you would have $5 per month or $50 you know, per year. And uh, this this would make it so this service bot would pick this up and be able to display that oh you know this is the basic tier it has a monthly and an annual plan we can you know let the user select it just like a, one of our customers cleverly did they have a monthly they have they basically the way they have is they have uh, three products each product has three prices so you can see there's a monthly price a three month price and a six month price that's how they they modeled it. And for our example, I'm just going to do a simple two-tiered app. So let's go ahead and create some uh, some tiers in our app. So we'll have this as uh, let's just call it tier one. Actually, we'll make it a simple tier. Uh, that sounds good. And we'll make this one ten dollars per month. Now, the, what we're actually going to be modeling here is gated content, so or gated features. So we're going to have a simple tier, which Kind of lets you access simple features and then we'll have advanced here which is going to let you access the advanced features uh, so we'll go ahead and the one, one of the key things to do when setting up service bot and that's all in the docs is setting up some metadata so um maker pad workshop we'll call it so sb service kind of ties these products that you're creating together and SB tier basically is the, the name of the tier. So we'll call it simple. Um, and there's ways of doing per unit, which like if you add a unit label here, service bot will understand that, oh, this is a unit base. So you can be like per user per month. Um, if you're trying to charge per, or per seat, that kind of pricing model. So this is basically gonna be our simple tier. I'm just gonna go ahead and save and add a, another one. We'll call this the advanced tier. And for this, we'll make it $50 per month. And then I have to add my metadata. So SB service is gonna be maker pad workshop. SB tier, we're gonna make advanced. All right, and that looks good to me. So we'll save that. Now this 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 now we're done configuring Stripe. I could add more. I think I will add some more prices in a little bit just to kind of show you that a uh, uh, different interval thing. But for now, we'll just keep it simple. Uh, so next thing we can do is actually open up Bubble. Uh, actually, I'll show you actually how it looks like in in, in our service bot before I do anything in Bubble. So let's say we want to just make this a plan picker for this. Uh, and if it should show up the service name that we put that SB service should show up on this list. There it is, MakerPad Workshop. So if we select that, we can actually get a nice preview of how this is going to look. So we see here, simple, advanced, $10 a month for simple, $50 a month for advanced. And then we can obviously do configurations like disable simple if we don't want them to select that. Um, and this is, could all be done dynamically as well. For example, like if the user has checked this box during onboarding, they shouldn't be able to access advanced. That's a, a use case we've seen before. Or some people want them not to even know there's other tiers, so you could hide advanced. 
or hide simple. So. Oh, that's quite interesting to actually show users. Like it's an easy way to show users different pricing models based off of like behavior leading up to the pricing page. I know a good example was somebody shared a case study of Zapier doing this quite extensively where different accounts were showing different prices uh, until like recently they've kind of consolidated a bit. So yeah, to be able to do that, that simply is awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, there's, there's also things where you can like have a coupon already applied if you wanted to. Um, and one of the other things that's really, so th that's, this is just the pricing plan picker. And you can also configure how checkout works. So when you actually click select plan on one of these things, you can pull, it will pull up this checkout form and we can uh, do things like hide specific fields, like the billing address. So if we don't care about any, we, if we care about having extra fields in here, like getting their street address and all that, we can collect that information by default. It hides all that because who likes to fill out more information than they, they usually do. You can collect shipping fields. One thing that a lot of people have access was this terms and conditions box, basically where you can, where they like to have people check this box before uh, doing their checkout. And you can actually add like a link to the actual page and that kind of functionality. That's cool. Um, and you can obviously set up a, a redirect after checkout so that you can send them to, to the next step in the process. Um, enable coupons obviously is a very popular one. Okay. And that just uses Stripe coupons. So if I were to create like a coupon here and say like, uh, you know, test coupon, and then you can give it like a 50% off discount. And then this, you could just type in whatever this ID is, you can type in that coupon box and uh, it'll actually apply it. So it's just that simple to get coupons working. I don't know if it'll work in the preview. Nice. Let me see if this will work. Test coupon. Yeah, coupons are another thing which are uh, traditionally quite tricky to do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the other thing that's nice that we have is a uh, integration. I don't know if you've heard of Rewardful. They are, yep. uh, they're, yeah, they're an affiliate program where it basically it lets you do affiliate. Let me pull up their website. Oh, get Rewardful. That's what it is. So these guys, we have an integration with these guys. So if if you have um, Rewardful in, integrated in your site, you, we kind of out of the box look at that reward because Rewardful stores a cookie in your browser. And ServiceBot is actually able to read that cookie and set because Rewardful is also kind of a Stripe only shop. So everything they do is through Stripe and Stripe metadata. So mm -hmm. what we do is uh, we grab the cookie that Rewardful sets for the affiliate. So it's, it's, if somebody gives you an affiliate link, um, that affiliate link stores sort of a cookie that lets you know who the affiliate person who should be getting credit for this uh, sale should be. ServiceBot will pull that, store it on in the Stripe metadata, and then Rewardful picks it up and says, "Oh, this subscription that was created has this metadata on it. Let's let's give this guy a kickback." Which is, which uh, we we really like these guys. Nice. So that's yeah, again, another it's tricky thing. Quite simply. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we have uh, obviously you can do kind of like we have some different languages here. Um, I think we, I don't remember. We I think these are all the ones we, yeah, we support these right now. Um, a lot of these actually have come from our customers who are like we we gave them the mapping and then they sent us over uh, the actual translations for it. So that, that was a lot of fun getting uh, all these getting more and more translations. Um, but yeah, so now that the, I, I'm not going to save this one just quite yet, I'm going to first go ahead and go through. We're going to jump into bubble now. Do you have any other questions before I jump into bubble stuff? Uh, nope, we're all good. All righty. Uh, so the key thing that I want to go through with bubble is if you're starting and you want to use service bot, I highly recommend checking out the starter kit. So it's basically it's called the service bot starter kit right, right now. I think I'm going to change the name to like billings, something more more about billing, but yeah, uh, we'll put a, you, you just search for service bot, you'll see it um, in bubble, I mean. So what this does is it already has service bot kind of configured in a sample bubble app. So uh, it's, it's a great starting point if you want to actually see how oh, they didn't used to make you have to fill out these, that's new. 
I guess they got tired of people not filling them out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so this is a great starter kit for uh, just learning how to actually integrate it. And I'll kind of be going through what this comes with out of the box, how to kind of adapt it to your to other people's needs, to your needs, whatever you want to do with it. And then I'm going to go through actually how we built this thing. And uh, I think that will be pretty, pretty good. Uh, so just to kind of start by showing, we'll, start, we'll just click preview here right out the box. We won't do anything. So I'm just going to put in a dummy email here. Oh, not that it matters. So let's go ahead and sign up. Uh, this happens sometimes with Bubble, where you like first create a, a Bubble app and it keeps telling me they just updated it. So I'm going to refresh. Oh, they did it again. Come on. I think it does some things on the, uh, like some sort of, they don't expect you to jump right into it. Because I think they have some back background processes that do updates and then it makes uh, the app gotcha. I think it's been updated. That's my guess, at least. <laughs> All right. So when you first get in, it already kind of comes out with it comes with some sort of uh, tier gating. So in this example, this is an example of a freemium type of app where you get in, you're able to access free lessons, and it's going to require you to upgrade to access premium lessons. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is click this upgrade button, and it's going to take me to a service bot embed that's already been pre-configured. Right, so here's premium tier. It's only a single tier app. You click um, select plan. This is on test mode, so it gives me this nice test card to copy and paste in there. Uh, you just put any sort of information in there. We're gonna subscribe to our $100 a month, and it punts us right back to the dashboard with premium lessons being unlocked. Now these are all obviously just dummy resources. The, you know, these don't actually exist in this application. This is just kind of um, hard coded in there with the, like these buttons don't do anything. Um, so this is just kind of to give you an example of how to build gated pieces in your application. And then the second piece that this thing has configured is once you actually do have a subscription created, you can click this billing button at the top and you're going to be able to access your subscription details. And this is our uh, subscription portal embed where you can, you know, cancel subscription, go ahead and change plan. If we had more plans, they would show up here. We can upgrade to a yearly plan. Um, we can go ahead and update our credit card information and obviously download invoices. So this brings up that uh, PDF download that I was talking about. And you can see we have a, you know, $100 due. Um, so that this is kind of out of the box what this, uh, what this does for us. Uh, nice. Yeah, that's, um, there's a lot of things kind of try to gate content it's tricky to tricky to like align the actual portal with like the membership tiers and the payment so <clears throat> it feels like there's there's like a few ways to do it which like connecting various apps together where you have to like sign up and then you have to send information like between between platforms but then to actually handle this portal with various pricings and coupons and invoicing is is something which is seems a lot harder than it should be um so it's nice to see something which seems easier than it should be yeah yeah that's definitely like this this portal right here is like one of the main reasons why like just so much goes into this like being able to you know pull your last four digits being able to get what you're actually paying for you know knowing what your next payment is being able to actually add a coupon so i can go ahead and uh I think I should be able to just apply this test coupon that I created. Um, and it should go ahead and uh, get applied if I click add coupon. Actually, no, this is a different Stripe account. Actually, no, I don't think it is. So this should still work. Uh, let's try it, shall we? Yeah, there we go. Coupon applied, 50% off. There we go. So let's say, um, just one question. Let's say somebody wanted to, um, they've embedded this 
they've got the plugin sorted out and they're using the price, they've got the pricing and product set up in Stripe. How would you go about like changing the pricing? Would this be done from service bot side or would this be done from Stripe side? That's a, that's a great question. So you would do it through the Stripe side. And uh, so the way that the, the, the way to do it is you go into your Stripe, click your products here. We would go, say we want to change like simple tier. You would go in here and just, um, you, you can literally just edit the price here and then uh, change it. And it would actually get, it would show up in your service bot automatically. So like I can, I, let, like, let me just show you, I can just edit this, change it to, uh, you know, $20 instead of 10, press save here. And if I refresh this page, it should automatically, uh, let me go back, click Maker Pad Workshop. It should automatically, you know, show up the $20. Got it. And there's also uh, elements. You can customize all the elements to that checkout page and portal from within ServiceBot. And am I right in thinking that it will dynamically update wherever it's yeah. embedded? You kind of have to exactly, add like a... exactly. Because, yeah. So, so it used to be in the previous version of ServiceBot that you would have to re-embed it, so re-copy and paste the code. But since our our launch this month or last month. Um, it's now stored in ServiceBot, so any changes you make to this billing page will show up automatically in your application. Got it. Nice. Yes. So uh, if, you, if you have any more questions, that'd be good. Or I, I'll jump into actually what's going on behind the scenes with uh, what you just saw here. Yeah, it'd be good to see um, what's going on behind the scenes and also how that ties back into the user side on Bubble, because I'm guessing you have obviously tied to um, different aspects or like let's say somebody had uh, users within a bubble app and then they upgraded. How, how do these two tie together? Right. So, yeah, so that's all done through uh, workflows in bubble. So the, the, the main place to go to see all this stuff is uh, there's two places, obviously the dashboard page and the subscription portal page. So uh, just to make this, let's get, let's just make things a little simple. Um, I'm going to dump, jump into the database. So in this template, we added four columns, Stripe customer ID, Stripe subscription ID, subscription status, and subscription tier. And uh, they're pretty uh, self-explanatory. Self subscription status is going to be either active or canceled. And um, subscription tier is going to be, in our case, uh, simple or advanced. Um, in this case, it, it, for the out-of-the-box template, you can see it's basically just going to be premium because we only have a single tier. And I can actually show you that if I look inside our app data. So you can see here, this is the one user we just went ahead and created. You can see all of these things kind of filled out. So uh, Stripe subscription ID is what it would show up in Stripe. I can copy that, uh, go to you know subscriptions, and then uh, just type in slash the subscription ID. And it'll pull up uh, this subscription within Stripe. This is what we, was actually created uh, through the embed. And obviously, the customer ID it works kind of the same way. It's just the customer and Stripe. These aren't actually 100% required, but I think they're really good to have within your bubble database. Um, you, you could well, do everything um, just through email. Sorry. No, um, I was going to say, so what um, are some of the workflows that come with this template? Right, so let's go ahead and jump into the subscription portal. This is where most of these workflows are gonna be. So there's four main ones that come with this template. We have a workflow that gets triggered when a subscription gets canceled. And what this actually does is it basically just changes the status to whatever the status becomes. Usually it'll, it'll, it could be, it's either gonna actually be still active because there are ways you can cancel and but have the cancellation occur at the end of the billing period. Um, so yeah. the other option is obviously subscription status equals canceled. If you select in your, uh, let me open up the, so let me, I'll show you actually what that would mean. So this checks that. Okay. So in the portal we have here, uh, cancel immediately. So this, if you, if you check this option, basically this means that when you, when you go to cancel here, it will automatically set the subscription to canceled and um, th that's technically gonna lock them out of the app depending on how you have it configured. So it's basically, it, it, from a user's perspective, it's basically, do you wanna lock them out immediately after they cancel or do you wanna wait until the billing period ends? So if they paid on the first 
you want them to have access to the app until the end of the month, which is, in my opinion, the, in most cases, that's what you're going to want. But there are definitely people cases where you want them to just get canceled immediately, depending on your business model. Yeah, this seems like an easier route round than kind of setting up like a reminder to yourself to cancel the membership at the end of the month, because especially if you're doing it like no code style, there's going to be like an automation or like a manual step to actually like canceling that um, yeah. or like an automation to remind you to cancel it or yeah. Yeah. It's, it can be quite tricky. Cool. So this one here is a actual, actually a resubscribe workflow. So when they actually have a canceled work, a canceled um, subscription, uh, this this will basically get triggered when a new when they click the resubscribe button because this uh, portal when it's a canceled subscription it will actually say resubscribe and give them a button to press and that'll recreate the subscription. Um, so I, I can show you here if I go ahead and cancel this. Uh, oh yeah, it lets you fill out a reason why you're leaving so you can start collecting churn data. Um, it gives you this uh, this resubscribe button. And I think actually right now this is configured to be, let me see if I go to dashboard. Yeah, so because I just canceled, um, I, I got locked out of the premium lessons. And uh, that, that, that was with this cancellation workflow because premium, that dashboard page actually looks at the subscription status to tell whether or not to give them access or not. So nice. that was the and cancellation workflow. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is actually done um through like proper like user authentication not some like other like strange way of getting content this is done like at the application at the application level yeah so that that's something that's a big difference between us and something like member stack because member stack is kind of like a hacky well it's, it's it does it a little differently um because they, they're not baked into the application they kind of have their own application baked into another application so this goes mm -hmm. directly with bubbles at, um, authentication so uh, I'll show you actually where the magic happens. The magic happens, this is an element. So we basically have these five elements, each one representing one of our embeds. Um, this is the customer, the plan picker slash customer portal. And this authentication HMAC you see at the top here is uh, where we're actually passing in a, the, the user's email and then a secret and bubble knows that you know this is a current logged in user it knows their email and then this is a secret that service bot gives um as part of its setup so if you go to like uh, uh integration here this is this it's a secret key and it basically tells you how to do it um if you're trying to set up a, a portal here where does it actually get where does it do oh here we go enable security hash so there's this authenticated secure setup. We have to save this. Right. So basically, um, it, it 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 basically tells you you need to generate this thing called an email hash. This is where this is where it used to be very developer heavy. You actually needed to know how to code it basically because you would stick one of these little snippets on your back end and it would act. This is how validation worked. Um, but with Bubble, we basically have a little a little way of uh, just you plug in these two fields, and Bubble generates the the token for you. So it's using Bubble's basically Bubble's backend to uh, pass that to the front end, so the secret isn't exposed. Yes, yeah, so, so it's this fully is kind secure. Of, um, yeah, so this is what I was going to say. So this is probably a really good way to actually handle like user authentication access and billing for like actually a valuable business like application where rather than say gating a bol a blog post or like a newsletter for instance so if you just wanted to say receive payment for like a newsletter you can add obviously like gate it through maybe another, another tool maybe that people are just gonna like pay a small amount but if you've actually got valuable business like data which you need to lock down at like an application level and you don't want people to like get around it somehow in the various ways that you can sometimes. This is probably, it sounds like this might be the better way to go. Yeah, for sure. Uh, basically we had in mind when we built this, this was gonna be used by SaaS companies to lock features or you know gate specific add-ons or the, any, any sort of use case under the sun. Um, we were that's what we built it for was like the, those software as a service use cases we we, we didn't uh, that, that's what this latest iteration was designed around 
so we really took um, security really seriously and you know making sure there wasn't any kind of little hacks that somebody could do to kind of get around because it's built into your own app it's kind of impossible really um, so that, that's kind of what 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 we were focusing on uh, one of the things yeah so this we... is and um, just make it like clear if people are watching this and are thinking about like gating content this isn't we're not talking about so like gating content on like Webflow or WordPress. This is for like Bubble specifically, which has like a user layer, like built into anything you build in Bubble. The user layer is exactly what you get, like out of the box in your database. It has workflows attached to it. So this is for like a full scale, like web application first, not a website with content that you don't want people to see sort of thing. Yeah, I think that member stack is a great use case for like gating content specifically. Um, I think that they that's, they do that very well, and especially if you're like on a web flow and you don't want to have any sort of back end. Um, I think yep. member stack's a great fit for that. But if you're trying to like get any more advanced in like, you know, even if you want to uh, even a, even advanced content gating where you can have like, you know, different pieces on like for just as an example, right, where you can have specific blocks on your site that you know you want it styled a certain way where you have like the content here gated but not this content um it's, it's a lot harder i think to do with uh you know th things like member stack just, just because like this you can actually like kind of build the logic in yourself and say like for example this this let uh or let me just pull open the element tree here so this is what's the hidden content, right? That this premium lesson you can have like conditionals where you know current user yep. subscription tier is this, and their subscription status is this, and then you can even add in a couple other you know things like oh you know they selected this checkbox during uh, onboarding. You can really uh, integrate it with your your application rather than kind of plugging it in. Yeah, you can. You can throw in some like user activity and if they've done like certain things you could show them different content but also what's interesting about this you're seeing um a gate a non-gated piece of content and a gated piece of content on the same page like on the same url so you're not gating at url level you're gating at like application module level which is exactly exactly yeah yeah and then uh like just being able to have the information of like you know their subscription tier is is um, whatever you know you can display just just have have like the subscription data within your application. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a challenge to do without like zaps and stuff. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I think one of the things I really want to dive into is uh, let's see if there's anything left on these workflows. Uh, these aren't that these are basically if you subscribe to a new subscription it fills out all this data it comes right from the embed so these are workflows that get basically all these workflows get triggered based on different events so you can like see um like basically in elements you have like uh, these are the, the the four workflows you can see there's these events that trigger these workflows and you can pull all this data out of the embeds and plug them into your bubble database however you want it. So in this case, like you subscribe to a new subscription, fill out all this data, and then just kick them, bump them back to the dashboard. Very simple workflow. Is these um, so these workflows you've got here? These are created for you. So when you, I guess, when you use the the template, the service book template, these are already there as kind of like a basis on which to start. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this, these workflows are already created with like this stuff already filled out for you in the template. Um, if you weren't, to, if you didn't want to use the template, or you already have an app and you want to integrate ServiceBot into that existing app, you just have to go into you know at an event, click elements, click one of these guys. It's like the big one is you know obviously uh, subscribes to a new subscription, and then you can you know go go ham on whatever else you want. Yep. Um, nice. As, yeah. Uh, so one thing I want to get into before we stop is uh, actually dive into one of the more complicated parts of uh, yep. this integration, which is the Stripe webhook side. So one thing that I really, pros. for the bubble pros, yeah, one thing I'm really proud of with this template is that we actually got um, a very basic Stripe webhook system in place. And I'll, I'll show you how that's going to work. So let me go ahead and just uh, let me open up this app and resubscribe. This one, one thing I wanted to show was uh, 
cancellations through the I want to show how to act how this actually syncs up with the of course okay so this should be refreshed and then it should show the subscription proper again yeah okay perfect um well sort of I think it just got screwed up let me try no okay Perfect, there we go. Um, so, so one thing I wanted to actually show was, uh, let's see, because we're running out of time a little bit here, was, uh, so we have this thing called backend workflows. Those who aren't familiar with backend workflows, these are basically, uh, Bubble, you can basically define a REST API within Bubble. So this is basically an API that you can call, it's a workflow you can call from an external source. So let's say you wanted something to happen in your bubble application, but you wanted it to get triggered from say like a zap or a workflow or a, a web hook. Yep. You can have it call one of these backend workflows and it, it can basically do anything you could. So for example, in this example, um, the, the Stripe has this system called web hooks. Um, those who aren't familiar, it's basically anytime an event happens within Stripe, um, it, it sends out a uh, HTTP request to whatever endpoint you have configured uh, and, and with, with a payload containing relevant data. And the most common way that this is actually used is uh, basically any, the most common way this is used is for payment failures. So for example, you're going along merrily, and then one of your customers, their subscription fails, their payment fails on the, on like this month's subscription. And you, you know, you try and recover it, you try and you know get this called dunning, where you try and get them to change their credit card. But if it ends up failing, the subscription is going to get canceled without them actually interacting with the application. So your application isn't going to know that that cancellation happened unless you integrate with Stripe's webhook system. Hmm. So Got it. basically what happens is the subscription will get canceled in Stripe. Stripe's going to send a request out to Bubble saying, hey, this subscription got updated. Do whatever you want with this update payload. And, and, and what this template basically comes with is a workflow that says, oh, anytime a subscription is updated, just take a look at the status of the subscription and set the, the we basically look for, we look for the customer and see if there's any any emails that match the customer that 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 subscription belongs to so we find the user mm -hmm. that that subscription belongs to and change their subscription status so and i'll show you actually how to hook this up it's pretty straightforward um basically the, the way that, that it works is you go into this api section um, you would have to make sure that enable workflow api and back back end workflows is checked this is the root level of uh, any workflows, backend workflows you want to call. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that right in there. And then you want slash and then the name of the actual work backend workflow. In this case, it's Stripe subscription update. So I'm going to just do Stripe subscription update. And then we're going to select some uh, nice subscription events that I care about. For example, subscription created is a good one. Deleted is a good Deleted basically means canceled and updated. So, and these all have the exact same payload. So it's really nice. You can just kind of handle all of these with one single backend workflow. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. So now anytime I, uh, it, it should just kind of work out of the box. So what I'm going to do to test this is, uh, so we have here, I'm going to just refresh, make sure we have the latest data. We should have an active subscription right now for this user. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and cancel it within Stripe. So Bubble would have no idea about it. And it should, basically, basically just me setting that one webhook, uh, it should be able to kind of figure out that uh, this should be the one I want. Yeah, so let's make sure SFE, SFE. Yeah, so it's the same subscription, same customer. I'm going to go ahead and cancel this in here. Cancel immediately. And you can obviously add refunds here if you, uh, that's a common use case. Because people like to manage, like, so if a customer comes to you and they say, hey, I want to cancel this subscription, it's kind of a pain in the ass if you want to do it through Stripe. Uh, you have to have those webhooks set up. Um, 
So I cancel that. I'm going to refresh this page. It should have gone through and set this to if everything worked properly, canceled. Perfect. So that was the, the actual Stripe webhook communicating with Bubble. Like instantly as well. So there's no instantly. Yeah, yeah. Like no messing around. There's no like waiting on it to come through and then having to go and like manually update it. Exactly. Exactly. And then this would work as well for like, you know, you can you can have it working and like I can imagine a case where you can actually create a subscription in in Stripe. So you can even create a customer in Stripe and have a webhook called Bubble and have it automatically create a, a, an email. So that all this data, you can basically set all of this within Bubble if you set up your webhooks properly. So, so um, it's really powerful way of, uh, of, of using Bubble is through these backend workflows and webhooks. But that's where things start getting, if, if you haven't set these up before, they, they can get a little messy. That's why it's really, that's why I really like this um, plugin because setting this up is actually kind of, it's not the most straightforward process because you have to do this whole thing where you detect the data. So like I can actually show you what this looks like. Like I can, if I were to try and create a new API endpoint, you can either manually define what the payload looks like, but they, but with like all these third party systems, the payload looks insane. So that's really not feasible. So you, most people go ahead and do this detect request data. And basically what this does is it, uh, it gives you this, this, this URL that you have to plug into, into, and it's, it's not that bad. So like I can actually show you what it looks like. So I'll, I'll create a new webhook. Uh, but for a non-developer who hasn't worked with this kind of stuff, it can be a little overwhelming. So let's go ahead and let's make a endpoint for, uh, let's just say customer created. How about that? That's a good one. And then uh, let's add the endpoint. So this endpoint, we have to just uh, send test webhook. And then what this is going to do is actually, yeah. So this is what it comes back with, which is all this stuff. And you're like, what the hell? Um, basically, you're supposed to press save here. And now you, you can actually use these workflow, um, use this data within your within your uh, thing. So we can have here request data. Uh, you can like start pulling things out. Like if you want to create a user every time a customer is created in Stripe, you can. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, email. So like here, email, and then you can set like you can put a temp password or whatever. Um, but yeah, th this is kind of like what somebody would have to go through. And they want to when they actually want to make it a live webhook, they'll have to ch basically update this, get rid of this initialize at the end because it's not that that's not going to work. And that's how you kind of do, do set how the, that's those webhooks actually get set up. Yeah, it's definitely nice that you kind of give one straight out of the box. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it just, just makes it a lot easier for because that's like very non-intuitive for uh, for somebody who's not a bubble expert. Absolutely. I think like webhooks and API requests, I think, are the step before like learning how to code. And I think yeah. people who are working with, with uh, no code tools kind of do reach that point. Let's say somebody's spending a lot of time uh, with something like Integromat or Zapier at the end, they do end up at the webhook stage. So you do kind of start to learn like how to trigger things from different points. Um, I do think the, uh, the backend workflows are something we should probably spend a lot more time on like teaching, like how you can actually make that happen by like creating like, your own API because they obviously have really good use cases for applications. So yeah, yeah. yeah. One of, this is one of the things I really love about like the direction like the no code community has been going is like one of the best things about no code is that people who have no idea how to code, they just start, they, they jump in and just through force of will, they like get things together. And then, you know, through that, they're really learning these core programming concepts like using REST APIs and integrating things together. And just through like sheer osmosis, they're starting to actually learn the things that, you know, developers just know and they, they could transition to coding from no code very much easier than, like, than if they were to just sit down and try and learn Python or something, you know, just because they're getting yeah, things done and, you know, it's a lot more rewarding for them. So. Yeah, we had um, just kind of had another uh, workshop before this one with Bubble, and they they got a lot of like new educational like content coming out, which I'm really excited for because 
Uh, one of the things that people don't think realize with Bubble, you can just use Bubble like as your entire backend. So you can create all your data schema and you can just use it as your your database and then serve up all your information on endpoints and then build your your front end elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, like that. This is that's like a a, a huge use case that I'm like a huge proponent for. Is like you build your your marketing material in something like Webflow. All, your landing page goes in there, and then whenever you want somebody to come to your secret sauce application that actually does the stuff, you just you know you send them send them to the a different subdomain or whatever that has your Bubble app on it. And even yep. that, you can have call, your Bubble application call like serverless functions somewhere in the cloud. Like if you actually know how to code, you could a developer could use be using Bubble like just to build like the front end components, just because it's such such like a much faster and better experience than actually developing a front end. Um, that <laughs> you can yeah. I, it, I I I am such a bad like front end. I mean I, I can do React and all that, but like when it comes to styling, I'm I'm just hopeless, absolutely hopeless. So it's a like, if I were to start like a new project right now, I would I would definitely use like Bubble as the front end for it, and probably a little bit of code that gets called by Bubble um, mm -hmm. through some sort of like a cloud function or Lambda function on in AWS. Gotcha. So yeah, that's really interesting to see how easy you can do billing and lock it down properly with Bubble. Because we have like, there's kind of two ways of thinking that we see at Makepad. There is the combo where you're using something like Webflow, Airtable, Zapier, Member Stack, um, and everything in between. And then for certain products or things that people are trying to build or businesses, it just doesn't make sense to do it like that. And you actually just need like a real application and that's when you move over to something like bubble to build and then this is where kind of like service spot is now like coming into its own because you're actually adding like a truly permissioned layer without with, with which seems like no hacks this is just truly integrated into the application yeah absolutely like our bread and butter right now is like right if you're using like a no code tool you're trying to build kind of just like a, an application like a SaaS application you should definitely consider like when you actually get to the billing aspect, it's, it's a real pain in the ass. Otherwise, like if you weren't using service bot to do all this, uh, you would have to be building out bubble workflows that are making straight up APIs to things like Stripe billing. And it gets really complicated really quickly. Yeah. And then you obviously just losing a lot of like granularity and what you can and can't show and how quickly you can cancel um, subscriptions and payments and, yeah, and obviously the customization options that you showed before. So, yeah, so, absolutely. So, what's coming? What's coming next, service? I know this is obviously a big release. You've really spent a lot, yeah. a lot of time working on getting out of there. Uh, what's next? Well, so the big thing that's coming next is we're we're, we're actually going to come up with a big integration with a system called TaxJar um, to have automatic taxes calculated. So on that checkout form I was showing you, basically you put in your, your address and the next, it would make an API called a tax chart. It'll actually tell you live how much you need to pay in taxes and collect those taxes automatically. Gotcha. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then, the, oh, sorry. No, no, carry on. So the second, the big uh, next thing was like just keep on coming out with integrations is really what we're focused on. And obviously, like this 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 next few months, I'm going to be working a lot in like just nailing down documentation. There's a there's a lot of holes right now, and uh, that I'm trying to fill with like um, just doing things like this. I'm going to be making videos on the, what we just talked about, um, mm -hmm. just kind of like showing basic use cases, that kind of things. Just to, it, we're just trying to focus on education for the next couple of months. But after that, it's just going to be straight up building integration after integration and just get as, on as many of these no code platforms as possible. Amazing. And um, what would you, would you like, what would you like people to start using service, but for what are some things or some of the features that you think should be utilized more, which currently aren't? Um, I, I really like, uh, I think this having, more complicated, not being afraid to use complex billing use cases. For example, like using ServiceBot and Bubble, you can build out like a seat-based uh, billing system where you charge your customers per user that they, that have been onboarded to a team. 
So like things like that, where you can actually like dream up any sort of billing scenario, you don't have to be afraid of implementing it anymore because we'll handle it. Gotcha. Well, one thing I'd like to try out is how to show like dynamic pricing based off of like previous activity. That's kind of one thing front of mind for me. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're basically saying like the number of button clicks you can get billed on, things like that. Mm. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Or if they've come from a, if they've had like previous activity in the past or they've like visited or, yeah, I don't know, just yeah, uh, thinking yeah. out loud. Yeah, one of the things we've actually talked a lot about amongst ourselves is actually uh, A B testing pricing models, um, which is another kind of like mm -hmm. side shoot of like showing different people different pricing um, based on it. Does, it could be just completely random or it could be based on country, like show, the, show certain countries different prices. That's actually uh, some of our customers have asked, asked us about. Like um, somebody in, in the UK wanted to start selling in like the Philippines and they wanted to show the Philippine yes. people a different price than the UK people because obviously they, they, mm -hmm. it's such a different economy there. Uh, yep. Yeah, that'd be great. I think there's there isn't a good solution for that, and there's obviously like ways that people are trying to game the system. So, would yeah, I think we actually did talk about this in the past. So it'd be good to actually be able to do that and by connecting it like with like payment gateway like stripe which i guess would enable like that security layer so if someone was like trying to use like a vpn through i don't know like vietnam and then ended up with like a us bank account and address then hopefully <laughs> you could just not give them that price yeah so th that's actually something we've talked about too and th there's a couple ways of handling like showing people different prices like right like but the display can be based on ip and then what you actually charge them could be based on where their credit card is or a combination of the two that kind of thing like uh, there's obviously no there's always going to be ways of kind of this is not like if somebody who's very motivated, they could probably figure out a way of getting a different price. But I think that's something that is just like cost of doing business. Being a rare person. Yeah, exactly. And you just find find out who that is. You just on like a one-on-one -on -one onboarding call. You're like, e yeah, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> nice. Ben, thanks very much for showing off that functionality of service bot. Something I'm really excited about and definitely a probably the best route to go for billing. Definitely on like, the bubble side. Uh, for sure so i'm going to be testing that out and it comes at a good time with everything that bubble are doing um and yeah congrats on the release and zero code conference talk was great as well so hopefully users are flooding to service bot signing up and, and trying it out and removing all that complexity which is a pain so yeah thanks yeah, th thanks for your time thanks so much for having me it was great talking to you tom um where can anyone find you online uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at bsteers underscore is my, uh, you can just DM me, so talk to me. I'm very open to meeting with people and anybody in the NOCA community want to chat with me, uh, I'm totally open to scheduling a call and you can just talk about whatever the hell you want. Uh, I just love Amazing. networking. Nice. We'll have to um, book in another one of these once. Um, oh yeah. Out some I would love to just get, uh, do another one of these. We can get it to some more of the deep stuff. So. Cause this was a very surface level kind of just kind of, there's a lot to cover with billing. So, um, yep. Yeah. Love your job. Thanks, man. And we'll definitely speak to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye.